Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is a return appearance with Kelly Lang. Kelly Lang is a singer-songwriter who previously came on the show back in September of 2021, where we talked about her single, I'm Not Going Anywhere, and all of the fantastic things that were happening at that time. So go back and check out that episode. That's where we really get the how did you get to where you are, her backstory kind of a thing. But in this episode... We talk about her new autobiography, which is also called I'm Not Going Anywhere, and that was just recently released in the audiobook format, with a foreword by her friend Olivia Newton-John. We talk a little bit about her relationship with Olivia Newton-John, who, coincidentally enough, she met through Barry Gibb, who is also a friend, and I ask her out of my own selfishness to tell me about her relationship with previous guest of this show, B.J. Thomas. We do talk a little bit about Kelly's album, Old Soul 2, which came out in November, which is an album where she covers soulful rock and roll and soul songs. That's a really good album. Uh, Some of those songs will blow you away. My personal favorite is What's Love Got to Do With It. Y'all know it, but you haven't heard her sing it, so go check that out. And then finally, we talk about Kelly's newest single, I Think It's Jesus, which also happens to be on Lori Morgan's newest album. The song is written by Kelly Lang, and on Lori's album, Lori sings it. And on Kelly's single, Kelly sings it. And wouldn't you know it, Kelly was kind enough to let me play it at the end of the episode. So stay tuned for that. It's her newest single, I Think It's Jesus. Go find out everything you need to know about Kelly Lang at kellylang.net. And this is my second conversation with singer, songwriter, and now author, Kelly Lang. Welcome back to Fascination Street Podcast. Kelly Lang, how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. I wish I'd slept a little more last night. I probably would be handling my day better. Oh, no. Did you have thunderstorms and an anxious dog like me? I am the anxious dog. I just had so, you know how you, you know, you got to get up early. You know, you got a lot on your plate. That's when you can't sleep. It's like everything was like piling up in my brain and and uh, just haven't had a chance to sleep today. But I'm good. I'm actually having a really good day. Well, that's awesome. And I think it's really sweet that you couldn't sleep because you were so excited to come back on the show. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this time we're not going to do the backstory and the get to know how she got to where she is. You can check that out on her previous appearance of Fascination Street Podcast, which came out almost two years ago, September of 2021. Yeah. So go check that out. That's where we dig into her backstory. This time we're going to talk about some things that are kind of sad and some things that are super cool. First, Kelly, I know that the last time we spoke, you had a single called I'm Not Going Anywhere. Yeah. You don't know this, nor should you. I have had a lot of music on my show. And so all of the songs that have been on my show, I made a little personal playlist that is just on my phone and on my Sonos in my house. And every time that that song comes into the rotation, kind of stop what I'm doing. I think about some of the people who have been in the position that you were that you had a friend in when you wrote the song. Did that make any sense? Yeah, <laughs> I think yeah. about the roots of that song, basically, and some of my connections to it. Right. That song came about when I was noticing uh, a friend of mine who was in hospice, and he was on his last, I'd say, last month of his life. And he had a lot of hospice nurses around him, but his wife was the only one that could really comfort him when she would say, honey, I'm not going anywhere. I'm I'm not leaving. I'm right here. And he just softened and his face softened. And it just, it seemed to take a lot of the fear uh, out of that transition for him. And I just felt that that was really important for us. And 16 years after I wrote the song, who knew that Ascension Hospitals would pick it up for their national campaign. And then even further that, who would have ever guessed us going through a pandemic? I mean, having to leave our loved ones in nursing homes and hospitals and, you know, the losses that so many people endured was overwhelming. And I've had so many really, really lovely letters written to me saying that that song helped their family comfort them or gave them something to talk about to their loved one that they were, they would be back. And remember Kelly's song, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just a tiny part of the feelings and the, and the love that I received back from that. I, I just, I felt very honored to have held the pen to have written such a song that would be of comfort. Well, it is a song of comfort. And also 
she mentioned it just briefly, guys, but that song actually the national commercial for the Ascension Hospital system. W- what does that feel like? <laughs> <laughs> it felt great. Are you kidding? You know, as a creative person, I'm sure you've got a lot of creative people that listen to you, and I, I bet you're a creative person as well. When you write something and you hope that people like it, you're putting your heart out there. You're putting, you know, your innermost feelings out there. And it's kind of scary, really. And then you think, oh, it didn't really go anywhere. Well, I'm here to tell you that that was a long 16 years and nothing is created in vain. You know, just hold on. It just be, just because you haven't seen success yet with what you've created doesn't mean that there's not a bigger thing at play. Timing is everything. I didn't see it coming, but it was a validation of my writing. It was a validation of my career. It's given me a lot of respect, I guess, amongst the writing community, music community. And uh, not to mention my my checking account looked pretty dang good for a minute. <laughs> was, That's good. It was nice. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Kelly Lang's husband is the great T.G. Shepard, who, if I'm not mistaken, he wrote the Folgers jingle, the best part of waking up, right? It's Folgers in your cup. He did. So how was that conversation when you woke up one morning and you were like, hey, TG, I got a national commercial, too. What's up? (laughs) And that's exactly what I did. (laughs) (laughs) No, you know what? It's really funny. TG and I, you would think that having two artists in the family, there would be some competition or headbutting or, you know, ego bruising or whatever. It's the sweetest thing because he's already been there, done that. I mean, he's seen the heights of the highest of mountains And he is so supportive of me and he loves to see me shine because it's like living vicariously again through me to be able to see these goals being met. And, you know, I'm well aware of his fame and his 21 number one hits and all that he's done. I have such great admiration for what he does. And I I don't want to be that. That's not even on my bucket list to have worked that hard for what he had to do to get to that. You know, I'm not even at the age I even want to have the desire to do that anymore. I'm just super proud of him. And we just do well together. We we support each other. And there is not an inch of competition between us. We love to sing together. We're actually recording a duet album right now that'll be out about Valentine's Day. And I'm starting to travel more on the road with him just because I miss him, you know, and and I get up and sing a few songs maybe on a show here or there. I think the people that are fans of his obviously know that we're together. We've been together almost 24 years now. So they're used to seeing me with him, but not necessarily seeing me on stage because we haven't really performed much together. But recently we're making an active decision to do that just because we just enjoy being together. Well, I love it. Congratulations on the nearly 24 years. That's like a century in the music business. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think you've got to be getting close to the record. I mean, Dolly has it, I guess, but her husband's not really in the business. So I don't know if that counts. <laughs> I think ours is like at least 200 years because we're both in the business. So we're going to just double it down. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> I know I keep saying this phrase, I'm not going anywhere, but it's also the title of your new autobiography. I say new, the audiobook was just released. Yes. And that was hard to do. Yeah, I bet it was. Did you voice it yourself? I did. And then TG did his chapter? Yes, he did his chapter. If you're like me, I'm a very busy person and I'm on the go all the time. So I don't really have the time to sit and physically read a book. I love to read. My attention span is a little bit less than it once was. I think I don't have the attention span to sit and read a big novel. I love interactive books. If I'm going to do them, I like uh, self-help things. With our book, what we decided to do, we learned through the pandemic that people were used to using QR codes. So after every chapter, I put a QR code in of videos that backed up the chapter you just read. Like if you're oh, wow. about me on Star Search, there's a video of me of 18 years old that goes with that chapter. So I'm a real visual person. So I thought that was really pretty cool to be interactive with the reader, but I'm busy. I don't take the time to sit down and read. And I'm, I'm not seeing as well as I once was able to see. So audiobook is a way for me to go. I enjoy, I can get more books in my life with, as audio. So it was a challenge. It took me a little while to do it. But once I got in there, it was really strange because I had to really relive those chapters that I didn't want to write in the first place. 
but I needed to because it was healing, you know, but to read them again, it was, it was kind of hard. I'm not going to lie because the book is about not only my music business, my love with TG, our marriage, our children, but it's about being diagnosed with breast cancer in the midst of a great life. And I was mad and I did not want to deal with it. And I ran into so many people that taught me along the way, but one of those people was Olivia Newton-John and she wrote the foreword to my book. She taught me how to live with a positive attitude, even though, you know, she taught me how to to smile in adversity and to be grateful and things that it's a choice. You know, some days I didn't want to, but look at me, I'm 18 years out now and I feel like I have something to say. And I feel like people can maybe feel inspiration seeing that I'm just alive. You know, I I don't have all the answers. I don't claim to, but I'm still here and I I wasn't supposed to be. This is a bizarre question, but I love to ask it. Why'd you write it? Who's this book for? For my kids. They were nine and 13 when I was going through this. I felt that at the time they were too young to really understand how big a deal that was. I was too young. I was 36. I was too young to really grasp how scary that really is because I just put blinders on. I just wanted it in my past so badly. I didn't want to talk about it for years. And then I thought how irresponsible of me and how disrespectful to my healing to not share what I learned throughout that with people. I wished I had somebody like myself to talk to or to learn from if I had just been newly diagnosed. So I I took myself out of my own ego. And I I decided to just be very raw in the book. The book starts out basically with me uh, during the pandemic, I was cleaning out the garage and I happened to run into all of these notes. The doctors told me to do a video or perhaps write a letter to my children just in case. I just couldn't bring myself to do that at the time, but I wrote notes just in case they needed to know what happened to me. I forgot about the notes because I've been living. I've, it's been my life sentence, not my death sentence. You know, I chose to look at it like that. But when I saw these notes, man, it hit me like a ton of bricks. My daughter, who is now 31, she called me the other day. She says, Mom, how old were you when you lost your dad? How old were you when you got divorced? How old were you when you had cancer? It just hit her that, oh my gosh, I'm close to my mom's age when she went through all this stuff. Oh my gosh. You know, so it's a gift to her. It's a gift to my my younger daughter for them to maybe not make the same mistakes I made, maybe go down the same path or maybe improve or something, but it was just a love letter to them. At the very least, get to know you a little bit better, right? Yeah. Because, you know, us as kids, we think, yeah, I'll talk to mom tomorrow. I'll talk to her. You know, you don't really know the full heart of your parents unless you just sit down and, and read about it. And none of us really ask those kinds of questions of our parents or anybody, really. No, we don't. And this is a very hard to read book. I don't even know that my kids will ever read it. It's a hard thing. However, the beautiful thing I I love about the book and I love having written it is it was like an elephant off of my chest. Once I wrote it, I was able to go, okay, now what? You know, (laughs) it's like it was something that was in my past, but it clearly does not define me now. And I think that's the bigger lesson that the girls can take from that because they've seen me thrive after this. I'm not letting anything get me down. That was that was the biggest lesson. And, you know, there's ups and downs. And more importantly, there's more ups in the end of the book that I'm anxious for them to be able to learn from. You mentioned that Olivia Newton-John wrote their foreword. I know that you did a song on her posthumous album, which was a duets album. Before we get to that album and your song on it, tell me about your relationship with Olivia Newton-John. How did that come about and what was the continuation of it? I met her when I was six years old, believe it or not, as a fan. She didn't remember that, of course. (laughs) (laughs) She was already Olivia Newton-John. She's like, oh my God, you look so familiar. (laughs) Yeah, like, oh wow, you're that fan. But I have a picture of us together. So as I met her as an adult, I had her sign that, which was really a full circle moment for me. Wow, that's really cool. It was really sweet. I became friends with Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees and his family. Long story, but we're lifelong friends at this point. We've been in each other's lives for almost 20 years now. He was doing a benefit concert in Florida for Diabetes Foundation, and we were down there supporting him and the benefit. He forgot to tell me that he had invited Olivia Newton-John in to sing a duet with him because it's just like drinking water to him, you know? 
So I'm sitting at their family table and all of a sudden she comes up and taps me on the shoulder and wants to know if she can sit with me. And I'm like, I I didn't know what to say. I was just like, oh, I'm speechless. Sweetest person, so down to earth. We instantly hit it off. We talked music, we talked kids, we talked breast cancer, we talked Barry, we talked, I mean, so much we had in common, friends we had in common, but I never thought I'd see her again. It was just like one of those one-off things. So the next day, this sounds so weird, but I'm, I was at Barry's house having lunch and here she comes again. She was coming over for lunch and I, what a streak of luck, you know, to really get. To- How do I get an invite to these lunches? This right? sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to sound name droppy. It's just, it's just what happened. Hey, it is what it is. People's friends are people's friends. Well, the music business is a, it's smaller than you think. You know, it's like if you were a doctor, you're going to hang out with other medical professionals. It's the same. I exclusively hang out with podcasters. You might. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But it's like if you're in the music business, that's kind of not uncommon, I suppose. Sure. I tell you, though, it is a different thing in different genres. Like most of us country artists hang out together. But for me to have branched into the rock and roll world, no, that was a little different. It was a little different. But since having met Barry, I'm now really close with like Marie Osmond or you know, a different, a different group of people that aren't necessarily in the country field. So my fields have branched. Anyway, Olivia and I became super, super close. Uh, she began calling me and texting me and sending me funny things, ideas, girly things, haircut ideas, makeup ideas, medical idea, you know, girlfriends, total girlfriends. And um, she said, you know, I want to hear you sing. And so I sent her very reluctantly an album. She liked that I sing really low for a woman. She started playing my albums at her dinner parties at her house. And I thought she was teasing, like being nice to me. Come to find out she wanted all of my collection because she wanted to keep them in rotation. And she wanted to talk to me about every album that I wrote, all the songs and why I wrote them. She was a very detailed friend gave me her thoughts on things and what she liked better than others. And I went to Australia with her and Barry for them to do a benefit concert over there. They sang, how can you mend a broken heart on this show? And I loved that it was a duet. I'd never heard it as a duet before. And so when we got back, she called and she goes, Hey, are you recording another album like a cover songs anytime soon? And I said, yes, but why, why, you know, She said, I just think they're cool. I just need another one for my collection. And I said, well, why don't you just come in and sing with me? I was kidding. I I (laughs) I didn't think she'd take me seriously. I really didn't. She said, okay, what are we going to sing? And I thought, oh my gosh, come up with something, you know? And I just heard them sing that. And I thought, you know, that's a good song for us because Barry introduced us. He wrote the song, blah, blah, blah. So we did. I did my part in Nashville and I met her in Vegas. She was doing a residency there. And she flew in a night early and we met at the Palms Casino uh, recording studio there at the casino. And she laid her part down. We recorded it and I put it on an album and I never really did anything about it. It was just more of like a, wow, that was fun (laughs) kind of thing. So I was really surprised to hear that she was putting it on her, what is now we know her last album. And, you know, it's amongst Dolly Parton and Mariah Carey and, John Travolta and Paul Anka and Barry Gibb and me. You know, so <laughs> it was like, you got to be kidding. But, you know, knowing her, that's just how she wrote. You were just as important to her as Queen of England. She was amazing. Well, more so because I don't think the Queen of England did a duet with her. So no, there. <laughs> I, I'll tell you a funny story about the Queen with her, though. Livia was here for dinner with Barry at my house, and Barry had just been knighted by King Charles. And Olivia had just been, I think they call it AC something in Australia. It's it's equivalent to the dame of Australia. But she was so sad because she wanted to be damed. You know, (laughs) she wanted to be Dame Olivia. And it wasn't that. So I knew she was a little sad that she hadn't been knighted by the queen, but very happy. So I made up these little hand towels and I had a monogrammed and I had Sir Barry, Lady Linda for his wife. Her husband's name is John, Amazon John. I had that on his towel. And I had Dame Olivia monogrammed on her. So she loved that. She even posted about it. You know, and then, of course, a few months later, indeed, she was received in the letter from the queen that that was to be happening, but it never did. In essence, it did, but not with, 
you know, the crown and the sword and all that because of the pandemic. Oh. But she named a dame. So I was really, really proud for her. That is so sweet. That song that is on Olivia's posthumous album, which is unfortunately titled Volume One. Right. Michael Jackson did the same thing, by the way. Hmm. His album History was called History Volume One. Oh, wow. And that came out like either 90, 91, 92, something like that. And the volume two never got made. So that song that's on there, was it originally a song that was on one of your albums? Yeah, it was How Can You Mend a Broken Heart that was on my album Throwback. She just went back and grabbed every duet she ever did with anybody and sorted them out. And I do believe they are coming out with volume two because she was in process of doing volume two oh, right cool. before she passed. So I think that will come to be. And there will be probably, if I'm not mistaken, I think Marie Osmond is on that. I can't think of the other names that I, I recall her talking about, but I think it, it's in process and, and I'm not sure when it will come, but it's it's really special. That's really cool. That's something to look forward to. Real quick, I just want to ask, a, just for my own personal amusement, will you tell me about your relationship with previous guest of this show, BJ Thomas? Oh, I loved BJ. Oh, my goodness. He's one of my favorite vocalists ever. I think he had like 14 Grammys or something. That was I, amazing. You, who counts at that point? You know, it's just like armfuls. One of the kindest men, just so unassuming, down to earth, quiet, sweet, funny, shy. And you wouldn't know that he would be BJ Thomas when you meet him. He was just super, super quiet and sweet. I just adored him and I got to know him better. He recorded a song with TG that I wrote with T called 100% Chance of Pain. And he came into the studio and it was it was such an <laughs> amazing thing to see him sing my song. And we just became buddies, you know, and we didn't see each other very often, but we would text on occasion and and encourage one another. And when I heard that he would, had gotten sick, I kept trying to text. And when this text got slower in between, I, I could just tell, you know, something was not, not right. And it just, uh, and, and I, when I need comfort, there's certain albums that I go to or certain artists that I go to. Um, he was always that go-to, you know, and, and I, I can't listen to it now because it, it hurts too much. Gotcha. Well, it might hurt a little bit less if you just listen to the theme song from Growing Pains over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> um, so I think it was back in November, you released an album, which was Old Soul 2. Yeah. Tell me about that album. Well, a lot of people are surprised that I delve into rock and roll, our soul type of music. Um, I was raised in country music. My dad was Conway Twitty's road manager for 25 years. And I just naturally went into the country field when I began singing. But my love is more than just country. My mom raised me on Gladys Knight and Frankie Valley and Elvis and, you know, all of these huge rock stars and pop stars or soul music. I mean, I had a plethora of music going on in my head as a kid, but it was kind of like, no, you're just country. You can't do anything but just country. I thought that was so limiting. You know, <laughs> I'm just great music is great music to me. And so when I got to a place in my life where I wasn't held down by a label's constricts on that, I thought, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do. I want to sing what I want to sing and what, what I really enjoy. And, you know, during the pandemic, we were all searching for something safe, you know, like, <laughs> Like, what can we go back to that was better than this, you know? And, you know, you would still hear those songs in the grocery stores or getting your car washed or whatever. They're still in the tapestry of our music every day. Things like, you know, Sting and, and Missing You and Midnight Train to Georgia. These are songs you still hear on the radio. But I just, out of honor for my mom, she raised me on these. I just did Old Soul One as a gift to her. But I had such a blast and I noticed people were really resonating with going back to a, a safer, more fun time in their lives. These music sparked memories, you know, for them. So I ran out of room on Old Soul 1. So thus Old Soul 2. I, you know what? I had so much fun and the artists, musicians had so much fun recording them. I could do probably 10 volumes and not be done with them because they're they're just great songs. That is beautiful. I particularly like What's Love Got to Do With It. That's a really beautiful, oh. it's it's well done by you. Great job. Well, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. 
you have three songs that you wrote that are on Lori Morgan's newest album. And one of them, I think, is also your newest single. I think it's Jesus. Am I right? You are. I actually wrote this song and I pitched it to Dolly Parton first. And I was waiting to hear back from Dolly. I said, Dolly, I really would like for you to do this more than anybody. If you are interested in that, please let me know. And if not, I'll I'll pitch it to other people. But I wanted to give you the first shot. So I was waiting to hear back from her and Lori heard it. And she goes, I'm cutting that song. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, you know, I'm waiting on Dolly. She goes, nope, I'm cutting it. And I said, oh, dear. Okay. But you know, the way I look at it is I love to hear different versions of the same song from different people. Like, you know, do you remember when Leanne Rimes and Trisha Yearwood did How Can I Live Without You? Of course. They were both on the charts at the same time. There's enough room for everybody, you know? So, and my intention was always to put my version out from the songwriter perspective, you know? And I'm not putting it out for, I'm not chasing radio charts. I'm, I'm not, I'm in my own lane from a writer's perspective. Lori is Lori Morgan. She's on a pedestal as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, I'm sure fans would want to hear both versions. So I'm excited to share both versions with people. Dolly Parton ended up writing me a lovely letter and said, Kelly, this song is amazing. When I cut a gospel album, I'm circling back around for that, but I don't want to hold you up. You do what you need to with it. But man, that letter, it gave me such confidence and validation in this song. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to to share that with you because it was, it was a life altering letter for a writer. That is really sweet. I'm pretty sure we're distant, distant, distant cousins, me and Dolly. My last name is Owens and that was her mother's maiden name. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. and supposedly my people are from Tennessee. It doesn't matter. But one of the other songs that, are, that sort of fits in that same category is the Garth Brooks song, Shameless, which was released like two years earlier by Billy Joel. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I, I like like you said, people love to hear songs by different people and um in you know different arrangements or whatever. I'm gonna ask you for one favor. It's okay if you say no. <laughs> As we're heading out, can I play I think it's Jesus? Can I play your new single? I would love for you to. It's about a human spiritual connection we all go through. We all get chills on our arms, we all get lumps in our throats, we all see random things in life and we go. Is it a coincidence? I think not. You know, so I'm just trying to put a name to this and and to unify us and connect us. Some people might not think it is, but I do, you know, and it might bring us all together to know that we're not alone. We're, we've all got something in common here. I love that. Thank you. And with that, oh my gosh, Kelly Lang, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day and your hectic songwriting and touring with your husband's schedule to hang out and let us get to know a little bit more about you on Fascination Street Podcast. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Go check out the video for I Think It's Jesus. I think you'll really enjoy. Oh, real quick, tell everybody where they can go to find out about all things Kelly Lang. KellyLang.net. And I'm really, really active on socials too. So I love Facebook. So hit me up on there and I'll see if I can get back with you. Thank you so much, Kelly. You have a great rest of your day. And again, thank you for taking this time to chat with us again. I appreciate you. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye.